Hi, Joel Rinsema here, Managing Artistic Director of Canner Eye from Denver, and I'm here today with Jake Runnestead, and we are very excited that uh, our collaborative project, uh, the recording Sing Wearing the Sky, is coming soon to radio stations near you. Woo! Yeah, Jake, it's been quite a journey. Um, tell us a little bit about the um, kind of background behind this project. Well, I can't even remember when we talked, but um, you had this idea of doing a, an album of my music, and I was absolutely thrilled. Um, we were able to work together, what was that, two falls ago now, I think, on a, on a program, and um, I, I just had such a great time working with you and the whole Cantorai family, and I knew that it'd be a really special collaboration, so I was excited. Um, and so we slated it for last summer, um, and had really a beautiful experience um, recording. I, I love that process because we can dig so deeply into the details. And, uh, and it was so fun because you and the ensemble are so responsive and so musical. And I love the way that you let things breathe. Um, and so I, I, it was just a, a, a blast uh, doing it. And I'm so thrilled that it's going to be released really soon. Well, yeah, that, that's part of the story, but I'll, I'll kind of fill you in on, uh, on the other part of the story. Uh, Jake and I, I actually took out Jake out for coffee. I think we met in Starbucks. You were out in Denver doing another uh, uh, performance. And I, I, I said to Jake, Jake, we'd love to record a full album of your music. And, you know, your eyes lit up and then they kind of dropped a little bit. And I said, well, there, there's another choir that's thinking about doing an album of my music. You you have to be one of the luckiest, most fortunate composers on the face of the planet to have two albums dedicated to your music come out within 12 months time. Um, you know, what was really fortunate though is, is and, and the whole collaborative nature of this was that we were able to work with that other ensemble, I'll name it Conspirare and Craig Ella Johnson, and really kind of decide uh, which pieces were going to be featured on each album. So yeah. here we are 12 months later with two full albums dedicated to your music, both very different, um, different performing forces, uh, different music. I think there's only one uh, track that crosses over between the two. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how do you feel about that? Two albums of your music in, in, in <laughs> one mean, year. It's a dream come true. Are you kidding me? <laughs> it's the best. Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel so incredibly fortunate. And, and I love both of the albums. I think they, they both, yeah, like you said, they are very different. And, and yeah, very different music. Um, and I love the way that each, each group brings out their own personality in the music. Um, and then also kind of brings it to life in, in a way that I had envisioned as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just on cloud nine. I'm, I'm really, really thrilled. Well, and on two very respected labels on Delos uh, with the hope of loving uh, mm -hmm. with Craig Hella and Conspirare and now with Naxos and Cantorai. Uh, yeah. We've had a real good partnership with Naxos and are really thrilled that this album uh, hopefully will see great success on Naxos. Um, I will tell you as a conductor, and I think the ensemble probably feels the same way, it was a little daunting have the, having a living composer in the same room uh, while you're singing his or her music. Um, I think we got over that right away. I think you were such a, a constructive um, voice in the whole process. We're used to hearing uh, Blanton Allspa, our producer, coming over the loudspeaker saying, do it again. But to have you there saying, let's try it again this way. Let, have, you, <laughs> have you considered it this way? In my very Minnesotan way. <laughs> very Minnesotan. So it, it was re a real refreshing opportunity for us to have the opportunity to bring your music to life and have your input all along the way. I mean, uh, yeah. in, in, in many ways, a number of these tracks on this album are premiere uh, recordings, at least on a major label. Yeah. And, and to have you in the room and help and, and assisting us and, and informing us um, we can truly say that some of these um, may be the def definitive for now interpretation of this music because the composer was involved. And so we're, we were really honored to have you a part of the journey. And uh, so thank you. Thank you uh, for your talents and your efforts that you lent to this program. Oh, well, it's my pleasure. It was such a joy. So let's dive into the uh, project. <clears throat> let's do it. You know, it's it, it's one of those things when you program music in a, for a concert, um, it's a much different mindset than putting together a complete album of 10 pieces by the same composer and, and how you make that all fit together. And I think we've, we collaboratively have come up with a really nice playlist, um, really wanted to capture the listener from the get go. And so mm -hmm. I, 
I, I still feel that The Secret of the Sea is a great way to capture the audience's attention. So tell us a little bit about this piece. Uh, if, if I didn't know otherwise, I'd think you were born on the sea. So this piece was commissioned by KI Concerts and Craig Hella Johnson, and uh, it was to be performed at the Sydney Opera House, which is kind of a, a daunting and intimidating commission. Um, but because the Opera House is right on the water, I knew that this piece had to be about the sea. And so I went searching for lots of different texts. It took me a really long time um, to find just the right, the right words that I felt captured this journey of, of life um, it, it, with the metaphor of, of the sea. And so I have various poets that I created a composite text, which is a combination of different poems, different texts that I put together uh, with a, a narrative um, that takes us on, on this journey of setting forth to sail and, uh, and kind of what it, what it means to look at the expanse of the sea and wonder about the earth and about your life. Um, and so it, the forces are string quartet and percussion and piano. And uh, I really tried to capture the sounds uh, that we might hear if we're at the water's edge with the crashing of waves um, and, and, and if it's a very serene maybe evening just that that very gradual movement of the water along the shore. Have you ever been sailing because I, I have to tell you in listening to the opening of this with the sails unfurling and catching the wind and riding on the waves I mean it's like I said it's, it almost sounds like you were you've been sailing all your life did, did <laughs> what kind of what kind of research went into uh, uh, creating this piece Well I haven't been in a huge sailboat but I've been on you know a catamaran a smaller catamaran and a, a very small sailboat um, you know a two kind of a two person thing. Um, but I think what, whenever I travel, I really try to absorb my surroundings in whatever way that I can. And then when I'm creating a new piece, it's, it's translating that place, but I guess it's more of the emotional quality of that experience of being in a certain place. So when you're standing at the edge of this incredibly vast body of water, what does that feel like? I think, you know, it has to do with these expansive uh, for me, harmonies. And so in this piece, I use a lot of the whole tone scale, which is, you know, I think expansive in nature. Um, and, uh, and I try to use other musical idioms uh, that might try to describe the emotional world that one might be in. Yeah, fantastic. Well, let's hear a little bit of it. So the next piece, Alleluia, uh, pretty popular word, pretty popular settings out there of this singular word. Uh, come to mind, uh, oh, Randall Thompson's Alleluia, Eric Whitaker's written in Alleluia. How did you approach this one word song maybe differently than some of the other composers or in a new and fresh way? Yeah, well, uh, I had a commission that was pretty strict. It couldn't be any longer than three minutes. <laughs> so. So it was for a conference performance, you know, ACDA conference. And so they're pretty, pretty particular about the timing. Um, and so I, f I just really wanted to explore a more um, rhythmic and buoyant version of, of that piece and kind of that, that joyful nature of what the, the word might, might feel like. Um, and so the, the, it's essentially a fast, slow, fast, three minute uh, piece. Um, with kind of the the outer parts as dance-like and the middle part a little bit more introspective. And, and really just taking that from the word itself, all of the rhythms, all of the lines, Alleluia, you know, whenever you speak that, um, that's, the, that's kind of the main rhythmic gesture that I, that I used to inform everything within the piece. 
you say dance like and automatically I think of uh, or right away I think of trying to dance to music by Sting. It, 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 you use so many mixed meters in here. I'd love to see somebody to try to dance to this. <laughs> but, uh, I, I love the middle section, though. I think the word hallelujah um, in that middle section takes on a whole new meaning and a whole new life. Mm-hmm. And it's so intimate and personal and it just blossoms. And, and I really, really appreciate that middle section because it's, it's, it's like a whole, it's a song within a song almost. Mm. And uh, we really, we really love playing with that text stress in the Alleluia. And so uh, let's hear just that middle section right now. Great. So I mentioned that there is one track that uh, is carried by both of the albums that have been out this last year. And it's probably your most popular piece out there um, right now. Uh, And I think it will be for a long time. And that's Let My Love Be Heard. And uh, why don't you just share uh, with us just a little bit about this piece, the background, the text that you've chosen. um, And, you know, some of the, um, I know that this song is in itself a mini requiem of sorts. Uh, Maybe talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so this was commissioned by Choral Arts Northwest uh, in Seattle, Robert Bode, conductor, who's been a really wonderful champion of my music for many years. And um, it was for their candlelit uh, wintertime concert. And I was actually working on another text and I was getting closer to the deadline. I was feeling stressed. That text wasn't working out. So I went back to my files and, and I came across this poem that I had saved from a collection of books that my um, grandmother gave me when my grandfather died. They belong to him. And they're these four little red books with gold on the edges. You open up, they smell like old books. And this is the only place I've been able to find this poem by Alfred Noyes. And, um, and I knew that it just felt right in that moment. And so I just, I tried to capture the scene that, that Noyes paints in this, in this poem, which is someone who is bringing a plea into the world and and sending it out into the sky and hoping that it will be lifted on the wings of angels. In the middle section, uh, I have these these swinging triplets that move and soar like the wings of the angels that gradually get higher and higher and higher in the sopranos and altos. And the tenors and basses repeat the phrase, let my love be heard with inversions that continue to rise. And so for me, it was important to paint that image that's described in the poem of of this plea being lifted to the sky and then released and hoping that it's heard or felt by by whoever it is that that this person wants it to be heard by. Yeah, like I said, this I think is one of your more popular um, uh, pieces on the disc and around the world of Ochis 8 uh, has recorded this piece as well. You were talking about the middle section, and I think one of our singers recently posted after they heard it uh, for the first time in this recording, um, one of our singers who was a part of the project said, you know, that crescendo that's built in the middle of this piece is unparalleled. Even, you know, you think of the um, Barber setting of of Anu's Day Mm -hmm. um, and how that crescendos. um, and, And I think you've just, it's amazing what you've done here and then when you get to the top of the crescendo and then you ask your singers to do the most crazy thing which is to sing pianissimo and come back (laughs) in with the initial theme (laughs) it's crazy so of course that's the section that uh, we're going to play right now um uh, it's just a glorious glorious piece of music Oh, thank you and what's so stunning about i think your version is just when we get to that that biggest moment you just hold it and it's like oh my god and they keep going oh and they keep going and they keep holding it's oh my god it's just 
it's so powerful. It's so powerful. Yeah, so, no, and, and uh, you know, to sing it in a room like St. John's Cathedral, where, yeah. where the room is actually part of the instrument, supporting really and allowing the voices to be able to do that was just incredible. Yeah. So without anything further, here it is. So how do you follow up a song like Let My Love Be Heard on an album? Well, I love this transition on this album, and that's going into Sing Wearing the Sky, the title um, song for this album. Tell me a little bit about the background, the text, and how you chose to, to, uh, to accompany the choir on this, this piece. Yeah, so this is a text by Lala, who is a 14th century Sufi mystic from the Kashmir region of India. And um, what I love about this text is it's, it's really talking about when you become comfortable with yourself, um, you have that, that kind of innate strength and power. And she says, and then you go naked and dance, which is this beautiful metaphor for you strip away whatever the world might say about you, and you are free to be exactly who you are. And so the opening of the piece is this meditative part where I think it's, it's really someone who is is working through all of those things that we have to work through as humans in order to push the, the difficulties aside and really love ourselves. And then when we get to that point, it's this dance. And so I knew that I wanted to have you know, percussion and something that could help us move with those rhythms. So we have um, tambourine. Uh, we also have a violin that kind of helps us to, to chug along with rhythmic interest. And, um, and, and, and it's also, it was so much fun to play with color and orchestration on this piece. So at one point the the choir is sounding like pizzicato on a string instrument. Um, they're doing these vocal glissandi uh, that just add this this rhythmic propulsive energy um, until we arrive at the very end of the piece. How did you come up with this this piece? Yeah, um, a lot of it is really following the, the text. I knew it wanted to be a dance. Um, and I was also, when I wrote it, I was actually listening to a lot of uh, Carnatic Indian music um, at the time. So I know I was steeped in that sound world. And there's a certain, um, I think, uh, freedom and buoyancy uh, in rhythm that I really wanted that I think is, is required for any music that might sound like a dance. So I just wanted it to be free and fun. Uh, and uh, so that's what I tried to capture. Fantastic. Well, we, we found a really great violinist in Sarah Whitna here. <sighs> and Mac Merchant joins us on piano and Rachel Hargroder on percussion. So here's just the last bit of Sing Wearing the Sky featuring the women of Cantorai.
one of the pieces that's been a real journey for me in in uh, the interpretation of and being able to convey that interpretation to the singers is the next piece, Live the Questions. Um, I found, you know, it's one of those pieces that I think I've grown a much greater, I loved the piece from the get-go, but really grown a greater appreciation for it, having lived with it for a while. And uh, a lot of that is just a more fully, un fully understanding the text uh, of this piece and, uh, and how relevant it is for my life personally, but I think for humanity. And so will you just share with us a little bit about the, the text of this and, and your inspiration and how you set that text to the music? Yeah, so this is um, a setting of a, of a letter um, that Rilke wrote to this young poet. That, there's this great collection called Letters to a Young Poet, in which this, this young poet wrote letters to Rilke asking advice. And essentially Rilke said, there's no one that can teach you how to write your poetry. It's your own journey. And they began this correspondence back and forth. Um, and later, after Rilke had died, the, the young poet Kapus had published these poems, or these, these letters. And so I excerpted one of the letters, uh, translated it, um, and uh, and that's that's what I chose for this piece. And it's it, it's about you know we have so many questions, we have so many uncertainties in our lives, and we can obsess about those as much as we want, but we're not going to find all of the answers. And so what I love about this is it's it's encouraging us to just live into those questions that we have, and then someday we'll arrive at the answer. But we can't. We can't stop our lives. We can't obsess about having to define all of these things. Um, and so it's, it's just this beautiful journey. And so the music has this kind of constant wandering that never quite arrives uh, or takes a while to arrive somewhere, which is very much intentional in trying to explore what that text was trying to say. Now, was this a commission as well? Did you write this for a um, specific individual or uh, an ensemble? Maybe some background there. Yeah, so this was also commissioned by Choral Arts Northwest uh, in Seattle, Robert Bodie, who also commissioned Let My Love Be Heard. Um, and, uh, and another choir that I really love um, feels like, like family to me. So um, yeah, I wanted to, to create that piece for them. Well, we're going to hear the answer to the question right now, and, and that's the point. the point. The point is to live everything and live into the questions. So here is Live the Questions. One of the things I love about your music, Jake, and the choir does as well, is the opportunity to kind of explore the full color palettes of the voice. In this next piece, We Can Mend the Sky, um, it, it's, there, there are moments that are almost violent in nature. Um, there are moments that are calming and peaceful, and then there are moments of just exuberant joy. Um, and, and you fit this into what, a seven minute piece of music, kind of multi-movement sort of. Um, tell us a little bit of history about this piece um, and how you were able in those seven minutes or whatever to be able to encourage the choir to almost become three different choirs within one. Yeah, so this was commissioned by the Master Chorale of Tampa Bay, which at the time was conducted by James Bass, uh, who's a great friend. And they were doing a concert on the immigrant experience, and um, and so I was I was trying to figure out what to write for that. And at the time, my sister was teaching at the Minnesota International Middle School, which is a, a school made up of of many students that are from East African countries like Somalia and Ethiopia. Um, and she had started a poetry club, and so I asked my sister if her students might be interested in creating poems that could be considered for this piece, and so. She just kind of opened it up to the school and got over a hundred submissions from students sharing really incredibly powerful poems about 
you know, having to leave their home and, and go someplace new that they didn't necessarily want to go to, about waiting for hours in line at uh, a refugee camp w- wait for dinner, um, hearing gunshots in the street. I mean, really, really incredibly powerful texts. And so I chose one by this young woman named Warda Muhammad, who was 14 at the time. And her poem is called Let My Dream Come True. And that's the backbone of this piece. Um, wondering what this new place is going to be like and, and wishing for a world without violence and hatred, um, a world with love. Uh, and so th- the piece is really kind of uh, that journey uh, of having to leave somewhere, go somewhere new, and hope that we will support each other um, in that process. And so the text is both in Somali and in English. There's a fugue in Somali, and uh, I'm not sure if there are any, another, any others <laughs> in the repertoire. Um, but it was it was a really powerful experience to to be able to work with Warda on this, um, and and to to learn about so many of the stories of of my sister's students, um, and so I just I tried to capture that experience the best that I could. You know the last words of this piece, Jake. Um, if we come together, we can mend a crack in the sky. Is so appropriate for what's going on in the world around us, and. Uh, just, just powerful, powerful words, and, and and a powerful way of setting these words. Uh, almost a gospel-infused chorus at the end, uh, featuring the wonderful solo of Julie Orlandini, and then Rachel Harkroder uh, on a on a drum, and uh, just so appropriate, and and really uh, captures the coming together in song, um, in harmony. Um, anything else you want to say about the end of this piece, and then we'll share just a little bit. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's something so special about bringing voices together to sing. Clearly, <laughs> that's kind of what we do. Not virtually, um, but together. Yeah, right, right. Um, and, and at this moment, I really just wanted us to have a refrain that we could meditate on at the end of the piece. And it's just that repeated over and over again. And then there's some improvisation that singers are encouraged to do along with just a, a, a beat on the drum. Um, and it's really just... You know, it, you could even get the audience to sing it. it. It was just my intention was to make it memorable, something we could connect with, and that could just really be, um, you know, just a phrase that we could take with us. You know, if you hear the piece once, that maybe that's what you can you can hold on to uh, and remember from it. Absolutely. So let's hear it. So the next piece on this album, Fear Not to Your Friend. Um, Jake, I know you've had many influences on your composition in your compositional life. Um, this one to me, I'm sorry, it, it smells a lot like Dominique Argento. Um, hmm. I, I don't know if you've ever heard that before or with this piece or not, but um, you know, I've had the opportunity to um, perform some of Dominique's uh, pieces in the past, but is, is there an accuracy to that at all? Um, I don't know. Is it just because you're both Minnesotan? That's interesting. I, you know, I, I think I wrote this before I knew his music, to be honest. And he is one of my absolute favorite composers. I, I adore his work. I think Walden Pond is just about as perfect as music can get. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think I knew his music uh, when I wrote this. I mean, this is an older piece. I wrote it in like 2012 or something like that. Um, wrote it for Seraphic Fire in Miami, wonderful professional choir down there. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess I don't know where where the influence comes from. <laughs> it's hard for a composer to say that. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, but, but but by by certain you've had some major influences on your life. Who are some of those people? Oh my gosh. Um, well, musical influences from an early age. A lot of the great singer-songwriters from the 60s and 70s, because we listen to a lot around the house. The Beatles, Billy Joel, 
Joni Mitchell, um, a lot of jazz, uh, a lot of great 90s pop. Um, I grew up listening to a lot of that, which I think had so, just wonderful melodies. Um, uh, gosh, Ben Folds, Dave Matthews Band, um, and, and into now, like Jacob Collier and Esperanza Spalding and Becca Stevens and Dominic Argento and Beethoven and Libby Larson. And I, like, like, I was going to say, are you, you going to come around? Or are you gonna All come over around the place. <laughs> um, but, I, but I think to say that, that everything that I absorb in the world, whether it's music or art or literature or scenery or you know, human interaction influences what I create. And, and that all goes into these pieces. You, your music has been called, um, I can't remember the phrase in your bio, something about socially conscious music. Um, how does that fit into this choice of text for this song? Um, it's, it, it's a song of encouragement, yeah. um, but maybe beyond that, how can, what can you share with us about Fear Not, Dear Friend? Yeah, so it's a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson, and it really is encouraging someone through a difficult time. Um, and and. I don't know exactly the the background of, of this poem for him, um, and in my research I couldn't really find a lot of information about it. Um, but for me, there was someone in my life um, who who was really struggling being who he wanted to be, and and having others accept that, especially within his family. And so I really had him in mind um, when I was writing this piece of of you know, life can be really difficult, but there are people around you that love you and, and it can get better. Um, and so I think this is a really, a really wonderful piece for anyone who might be going through a difficult time um, in life. Fantastic. Let's hear a little bit of it. We return to nature on this next song, Proud Music of the Storm. Talk about it a little bit, Jake. Um, <laughs> we've got winds, we've got trees, we've got mountains, we've got the sea again. Um, nature plays a very important part in, in your life. Every time you come to Colorado, you try, you, you, you get out there and hike and, and enjoy nature. Um, have you done a 14er yet? Uh, no, not yet. For those of you who don't know, we've got lots of uh, mountains in Colorado that are over 14,000 feet. So, uh, Jake, next time you're out here, you're going to have to uh, climb one of those. I yes. know a, n a number of our singers who would love to join you on that. I would love to do that. But tell us a little bit about uh, Proud Music of the Storm. Yeah, this is a poem by Walt Whitman, and um, I've, I've excerpted the poem for this piece. Um, but it was commissioned by the Dallas Symphony Chorus, uh, Josh Haberman, conductor, and um, it's really all about the sounds that make up our world. And so a lot of that is, is nature. But through it, Whitman kind of lists off all of these sounds that have influenced and inspired him to live and to create. So it starts with this kind of, you know, very much Whitman-esque call to life. Um, and then we, then we move into this kind of dream world where I imagine him uh, just maybe lying down and, and, and envisioning his past and all of these sounds from, you know, mother's lullaby to opera and chants and uh, marches and dances as he lists them off. Um, and so I wanted to make a little bit of a, of a lullaby dream world in the middle. And then at the end, we go back to kind of that Whitman-esque fanfare, go forth and, and write or create or live. Um, and so I think the excerpt that we're going to play is from the lullaby. Um, which I also offer a little nod to Brahms uh, in, so if you can listen and catch that, uh, that's something I snuck in there. But uh, yeah, I wanted it to, to sound like a music box. Yeah, yeah. well, and, and this has been orchestrated, I understand as well? Yep, yep, mm -hmm. yeah, there's an orchestra version and a wind ensemble version too. 
Fantastic. Well, let's hear a little bit of this lullaby. So you draw texts from all over the place. Um, this next piece is chosen from the Bible. Um, I will lift mine eyes, a uh, very famous psalm setting. And really here is, is a, treated as a benediction and a blessing. Um, tell us a little bit about the background. Was this another commission that you wrote this uh, piece for? Um, this is an early piece, uh, as I understand it. Yeah, this is, I think, maybe my second or third choral piece. So I wrote it back when I was in college. Very, very old piece. <laughs> uh, and I, I remember I wrote it like over a winter break um, when I was uh, at home um, from school. And um, I really don't remember much surrounding why or how I wrote it. Um, but I think it, I think it came relatively quickly to me. And it, it just kind of wrote itself, as some people say. I mean, there's a lot of work involved, but... Um, it felt like one of those that just kind of sang right off the page. Um, yeah, and so it's just a, a kind of a sweet little piece. And um, uh, the, the climax is definitely one of my favorite parts, which is what I think the clip, the clip is uh, that we're going to hear. Um, so just did my best to, to kind of paint a mountainous landscape that the text talks about. Yeah, and, and so I don't want to get into religion or anything like that, but there's a real spiritual nature about this. Obviously, it's from the Bible, but, um, you know, the, the, the words are very comforting. Um, the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your soul. And I think it's a soothing balm for especially, again, and, and very uh, relevant to uh, what's going on in the world here. And, and it's a beautiful devotional. And in some ways, it, it uh, you know, we start big and brash uh, with this album. And, and, and I'll explain why I'm saying this, but this is the nice bookend on the other side is just a benediction, a blessing a going forth. Um, so let's, let's hear that, that, that section in, in the song and then we'll talk about our final selection on the album. So this next piece is really kind of a built-in encore, I think, to the project. Um, and, uh, you know, is it a case, Jake, of not finding the right text so you make up your own? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think that um, I, I do spend a really long time finding text. It takes me a while. Uh, so there is something to be said about that. But also, sometimes I think it's really fun to, to just have total free reign of sound and not, not have to worry about setting a specific text. So for Nair Nair, this piece, um, it's all about fun sounds one can make, or unique sounds that one can make with the human voice. So, you know, there's, uh, there's such a, a variety of kind of nasal and percussive, um, and you know, one thing, maybe it sounds like funk guitar near the end. So it's really all about exploring the voice and having fun singing together. And it's deceptively hard, I will say, <laughs> that we, we, we all felt that way. And I will say that there, there was no uh, 
greater moment than when I said, Jake, I can't climb into your brain and figure out how the song goes. So why don't you come from behind the screen and come and conduct it? Yeah. And the singers, singers got a kick out of that. And so, yes, not only do you have credit as composer on this album, but on this final uh, uh, track on the album, you are indeed the conductor. And yeah. it was just such a blast to close out our project with the song. And, and, and uh, yeah, you'll hear it. You hear the joy in the singer's voices and having fun exploring yet more colors in the palette of, the, of their voice. And so here, yeah. here's, the, here's our final track of the album and we'll be right back uh, for some cl closing comments, but uh, here's Near Near. Thanks, Jake, for joining us today um, to celebrate uh, this new offering out into the world. Um, Ken or I uh, had a great time uh, learning your music, um, getting to know you much better. Uh, likewise, um, you've become a good friend, and I and I really appreciate your friendship and your um, your role as an advisor through all this project. And I look forward to making music again uh, in the future. Um, anything you want to add at the uh, about the album or about the process? Yeah, well, you know, I feel the same. I, uh, one thing that I, I think is so special about Cantora is the, the feeling of family. You know, I immediately felt welcomed into the community and, and I knew that it was gonna be a really special collaboration just because everyone just, we felt like we were all in it for the right reasons and, um, and, and also, you know, so incredibly musical. Every, every phrase is, is created with such care. And that means a lot to those who create the music and want it, want it cared for. So I'm really, really proud of your work and, and I'm so proud of this album and I can't wait for the world to hear it. I wanna thank all of our singers for their heart and dedication and their talents that they uh, brought to this uh, project. Um, I also wanna thank the instrumentalists who, inv who were involved in this program, uh, Christine Short and Sarah Whitna on violin, Brighton Schlumpf on viola, Trevor Minton on cello, Jeremy Nicholas on bass, percussionists Rachel Hargroder and Daniel Kent, and Mac Merchant on piano. I want to thank our board of directors for their support and their investment in this project. I want to thank our recording team um, from Soundmirror, Blanton Allspa, our producer, and Brandon Johnson, our engineer. I want to thank our friends at Naxos for uh, trusting us with this project. Um, and I want to thank all the many patrons and donors who helped make this project possible. And finally, also to you, Jake, for your talents um, and for coming along with us on this journey. Um, you know, our hope obviously is that uh, your pieces will be performed even more around the world. Um, this, this album, Sing Wearing the Sky, is available on all your major online retailers, iTunes, Apple Music, on Amazon, Spotify, and Deezer. So get your copy today. Thank you, Joel. It's been such a joy and I can't wait. Can't wait. Everybody go listen. Yay. Go listen. Thanks for, yeah. <laughs> thanks for, thanks y'all for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you.